Hello, this is Scott Milliken, lead developer of the open source software project called OpenDCIM. Today I'm making a return to YouTube video instruction after what has apparently been four years. I hope the wait was worth it. I cannot guarantee that I will not ramble. This may be longer than it should be, but uh, hopefully both you and I will have fun in the process. Today I'm going to be talking about some of the new features coming out with version 20.01 which as of today, uh, July 17th, 2020, uh, I anticipate to be about two weeks away. Basically, I need to give a couple of weeks for people to do some testing uh, and then a couple of last minute uh, bug fixes, uh, of course, that the testers are likely to find. So specifically, I'm gonna be talking about SAML integration using the container distribution or and using the container distribution of OpenDSIM. You do not have to use the container version to take advantage of the SAML features. Um, SAML has been in OpenDSIM for a while, but it was not very user-friendly or even really system administrator friendly to get set up. So I've um, recently, with my day job, uh, had to take over SAML administration, and that means I learned a heck of a lot about it, which uh, has basically translated into me being able to make it a lot easier to do within OpenDSIM. So, uh, that being said, um, like I said, uh, about two weeks is when I anticipate having the real version of 20.01 out. Um, if you are not already a subscriber to the mailing list, that is the best way to communicate with us and to find out when that actual release comes out. Um, I will be disabling the comments on the YouTube video once I've got it uploaded because I have learned over the years, never read the comments. Actually, uh, before I disable comments, I will put the URL to join the mailing list as well as the URL for the main website uh, into the comments, and then I'll disable them. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the Docker Hub page for OpenDSIM. If you go to Docker Hub, you can just search for OpenDSIM. And there are a couple of other people who have made a container for OpenDSIM, um, but they're not the ones that have got the official build, I guess. Um, so I have actually registered the account OpenDSIM. So uh, that's how you would know that that's the official one. Uh, anybody uh, who's made another container, um, it's probably really just for their own edification and it may not necessarily be um, the uh, all the files that would be within the release uh, version. So that's mostly just a CYA kind of thing to say. All right, so you will see that it contains uh, an overview here, but mainly it uh, has instructions for how you can get it up and running. So in the simplest form, like if you wanted to run it on your workstation uh, and you had Docker installed, then you could just uh, basically type this command. Uh, what it's gonna do is it's gonna run as a daemon and it's gonna map port 80 to port 80. So the containers port 80 becomes port 80 on your workstation. It's going to map a volume whatever your local var dub dub uh i'm sorry the container var dub dub html assets is the mount point and it's going to use your local directory opt open dsim uh, in order to provide some storage and we'll get into that in a little bit and then um we're also going to pass an environment variable open dsim database host equals whatever your particular host is and then this is actually not something that would work right now because if you take a look at the tags I have removed the latest tag there is no latest the only available image that is out there right now is 20.01 dash beta so these instructions would be accurate most other times but until I actually have the um, first official version out there I'm uh, not going to use the latest tag um, you should also never use latest for anything that you're running in production because as we make modifications and as we get to the point to where we're making nightly builds or weekly builds, um, you would no longer be running a, um, a production release version. You'd be running the development version, and that's not something that you want to have your production data on. So never use the latest tag uh, in what you are using. You'll also see that we have a section called environment variables. Um, if you've ever used older versions of OpenDSIM, uh, you'll know that one of the first things you have to do is tell it how to talk to your database. 
you know, where it is and what the username is and the password and what the database name is and such. You also have to tell it how you are authenticating uh, your users. Well, when you're using a container, getting into the container file system and modifying files, not really something that you can do because every time that you start the container back up, it goes back to the version that was uploaded to Docker Hub. So that can become problematic. So the way that we've gotten around that is you can set environment variables. So these particular variable names uh, will toggle certain things uh, that you would have previously had to edit in the db.inc.php file. Um, this is also something that you can use even if you're not using the container version. Um, it's still the db.php checks for these particular environment variables. So you could create an environment like if you're running Apache in, in a changed root environment. You could set some variables that have all of this information so that you're not having to modify that file every single time. Uh, the nice thing is that by going with environment variables, uh, you know, you're, you deploy version 20.01 today, and then let's say we come out with a version 20.02. Um, all you have to do is get the new container because the environment variables are the same, and you don't have to go in and map anything. It's already set. Um, so no more having to, you know, grab the latest version of the db.inc.php dash dist and copying it over and modifying it. So um, anyway, it turns out to be a win for both us as developers and you as the users because, um, you know, that's going to reduce a lot of the, hey, how do I get this running? The other thing is by uh, distributing a container version, um, there's no more of the, oh, what packages do I need to install on my operating system to get this to run? Um, you know, hey, you've got instructions written out for, CentOS version, you know, 7.3, but I'm running, you know, <laughs> Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8.1, and, you know, is it the same? Well, it usually kind of is. But the thing is, if we have a container, all you need to do is run Docker, or more likely, you're going to be running Kubernetes uh, in some kind of environment um, as your orchestrator. And as long as we have a container, uh, it doesn't matter what the host operating system is, as long as it can run uh, those containers. So we've packaged all the pieces that are required to run OpenDSIM into this container itself. So let's get into it. Um, in my installation, I have got these environment variables. Uh, I'm using Rancher as my uh, Kubernetes distribution. That is an open source uh, Kubernetes, um, not really a distribution as much as it is a management system. Um, it allows you to manage uh, clusters that you could have either in VMs, you know, bare metal. It could be up in AWS or Google or um, or Azure. So there's lots of different ways that it's not just a Kubernetes distribution. It is the actual manager um, that makes things a whole lot simpler. Um, so anyway, uh, and no, I'm not a, getting paid by them to do anything. They're act, they're an open source company, but they do actually have support that you can get. Um, I just think it's a really cool. Um, product. So let's take a look at our config map. So a config map is basically just key value pairs. And so I've got these keys and these are the values. So I can reference them when I have a deployment. And a deployment is what you call the actual description of the container or containers that you're going to be running in your environment. Uh, so let's come over here to our workloads because we want to see what we're going to have. As you can see, there are no workloads deployed. Now, you do have to have MySQL in order to run OpenDSIM. You can run MySQL in a Kubernetes cluster. However, doing it safely and correctly is a much longer and much more complicated discussion, and that's not what OpenDSIM is trying to help you support. Um, go figure out the MySQL portion of it, um, and then we'll just reference it from here. So we will be referencing a MySQL server that is not part of the cluster. Um, I figured if I had one in here, it would just lead to a whole lot of questions about how'd you do this and what do you do. And I don't have enough time to, to spend a whole lot of time on this as it is. If I had to start fielding a bunch of questions about running MySQL in Kubernetes, um, I'd basically have to just abandon the mailing list uh, altogether. So let's start up a deploy or let's um 
let's change things. Let's start up a fresh install. Um, actually, let me check and make sure that I cleared out my database real quick. I don't think I did. So, drop database. I did not, so. Now we have a blank database because I wanted to show this from scratch. So we're going to deploy a workload and we're going to call it dsim and we're going to put it in the namespace called dsim. And the image that I want to use is going to be open dsim, open dsim. If I can type here 20.01 beta. All right, so that's the bare minimum to get a container running, but that's not really much information. So there's a few other things that we need to do. We need to add our environment variables that we talked about. And I'm instead of typing them in manually here, and that is another way that you can do this, um, but uh, I just liked separating it out into a config map. It's a little bit uh, cleaner in my mind. So I'm going to go to my config map, and I'm going to choose the dsim config map. And I can either map an individual key or I can map all the keys into the environment. So I want to do all of the keys because that's why I put them there, right? Um, then another thing that's pretty important when you're running uh, containers is your orchestrator really should have a way to figure out if your container is locked up or dead or something like that. Um, because, you know, otherwise why go to Kubernetes? You know, you want things to be self-healing. Um, when it detects a problem, it doesn't necessarily detect it so fast that nobody ever has an issue, but you d can detect it within enough period of time to where there's no long-term issue and it can automatically fix itself. So we're going to check on HTTP. And since we wanted to have a way to tell if Apache is running, but, you know, if you've got problems getting to your database, you kind of want to still be able to look at the logs. You don't want it to restart your container just because it can't get to the database, right? Um, so we want it to have something that's just truly Apache is the only thing being used. So slash heartbeat ah, dot HTML is, uh, it's just a file that returns an OK. So that is a great way to check the heartbeat. So um, we are running on port 80 because it is Apache. And let's say we want to start checking after 20 seconds. We'll give it 20 seconds to get started up. And we will check it every, it says two seconds here. That seems a lot. Let's go with 10 seconds. So, and it's healthy after one success. And it's unhealthy after three failures. And it has up to two seconds for each check to respond. That seems pretty good, okay? So now we've added pretty good bit of information in here. Um, if you'll recall, looking down here, I specified that there is a volume, an amount point that gets added in. So um, what this gets used for is to store your pictures of the devices that you want to have in the racks and also your drawings of your data center, the floor plans. Um, so there needs to be some way to keep that information. So now, yes, containers are ephemeral, but it doesn't mean that you can't ever have any data that's stored with them. You just need to have them separate from the application. So that is why we have a separate mount point that you can use for um, setting up where your drawings, pictures, and also custom reports can go. So that particular path is var www.html assets. So we're going to copy this here, and we're going to add a volume. Now, one thing I wish Rancher would fix would be the ability to add an NFS volume through the UI, but they don't. They just have local path volumes. So we're going to have to do this and then go in and change it. So we're going to mount at that point there. And I'm just going to go ahead and put in... My full path. So, now I'm going to launch this, and it's going to fail because this is not a path that exists on my server or on the Kubernetes server. 
But what it did is it went ahead and it kind of put all the placeholders in there for me. So I can now go in and edit the YAML. And I just have to change this host path to be an NFS. And I take the server name out of that. Whoops, went too far. There we go. So we change it to path and server. So now instead of being a host path, it's an NFS. And there's the path and there's the server. All right, so I'm going to save that. And what it's going to do is it's going to start up a new container, which it's doing here. This one, you can see it had an error because it couldn't find. Or the syntax was wrong for that local one. So as soon as this container spins up, then this one will get um, disposed of. So uh, you'll notice, uh, or you'll remember that we set the health check at, I think, 20 seconds to start. So it took it about 20 seconds to get started up, and here we have our container. We can take a look at the logs. You can see it's just straight up Apache logs. So, um, and then here it is. The heartbeat is check is getting checked on a regular basis. All right, so we have a workload. How do we get to it? Well, you have to create an ingress rule, so we're going to do that next. And I'm going to call it dsim. It runs in the namespace dsim. I already have a host name set up in DNS. dsim.cadmuslabs.net. And I want the root path and everything below it to be serviced by the workload called dsim on port 80. And I also want to run SSL. So I have a certificate preloaded in here. It's a wildcard. And dsim.cadmuslabs.net. Okay, so we'll save that. And we'll give it a minute or so. Oh, doesn't even take that long. So it has now activated this particular route to get into that workload. So when you uh, start up with a fresh database, the first person to hit, or the first time somebody hits index.php with a browser, it actually creates the database and does the install. Um, now the container version is a little bit different from the um, previous versions that we've had. Um, it doesn't require that you delete or rename the install.php. It simply checks to see what the database version is and compares it to the version uh, that is in the container itself. If they match, then it doesn't need to do an install. If there's a mismatch, then it does need to run through the install. So pretty simple. So let's go ahead and pull up our web page. And here we are. So let's go back to something that is on the Docker page instruction. There is a section about bootstrapping your initial load. We're going to walk through that right now. So if you'll recall, I've got my authentication set to LDAP, even though I said in the video we're going to be talking about SAML, right? Um, but LDAP is the mechanism that allows me to use what we call the emergency debug password to get in and eventually configure for my real environment, which is going to be using SAML. So what I'm going to do is after we get the initial install done is I'm going to configure it for SAML or what we call modern authentication. And by we, I don't mean the developers in OpenDSIM. I mean pretty much the world. Um, there's a term called modern authentication. If you're wondering what the difference is between modern authentication and LDAP or what is called basic authentication, um, really LDAP is, a, is an underlying mechanism. But basic authentication is what... You know, if you go to a web page and you get the little pop-up and it says enter your username and password, um, that's basic authentication. Anytime that you have to give an application your username and password, that is basic authentication. Modern authentication is where you have two pieces of the equation. You have a service provider, which would be your web page. In this case, it's OpenDSIM. And then you have an identity provider which could have any number of backends. It could be Azure AD FS, it could be Azure AD, it could be um, LDAP, it could be a database with usernames and passwords in it, it could be a file, um, 
that gets referenced. Um, it could be some other, you know, custom application, et cetera. But your identity provider is a broker that says there are a certain group, there is a certain group of identities that I am a trusted authority to um, basically validate and, and authenticate. So the service provider and the identity provider have to provide a little bit of information to each other in advance so that they know who to trust. So there are certificates involved. And don't worry, there's an easy, there's an easy button for that. But basically there are certificates involved so that the identity provider knows that they're really talking to the service provider and that the service provider really knows that they got a response from the identity provider. And you don't have to have them publicly available. The only thing that has to actually be able to talk to both the service provider and the identity provider is the client that is accessing the application. So this works for things that are internal only. This works for things that are behind firewalls. And, you know, it, it's, it really makes it a lot simpler once you migrate over to modern authentication. So um, it also allows you to do complex things. So for instance, you know, in my day job, I'm now the SAML administrator. And, you know, there are some cases where we have to have a higher level of assurance of who someone is. So we may have to have a, um, uh, a PIV card, or we may have to have um, an RSA token in order to validate who the person is, not just their username and password. So we can set up complex rules that determine, you know, when you have to, to validate on, on, you know, various, uh, various levels of assurance is what it's called in the PKI world. Um, and that's just, that's just getting way beyond what you can do with, you know, a simple username and password. Just think of the nightmare it would be to have to manage all the code if you had to write that code in every single time you wrote a new application. Instead, you just, you plug into SAML, you let the identity provider handle it, you're good. So, um, I have installed an identity and access management system. It's open source. It's called Keycloak. Um, I think Red Hat is who maintains it. Uh, but basically, it is a full-fledged identity and access management system. Um, it has plugins that can go out and, you know, modify your passwords on systems, and you know, you, or you can write any any plugins that you want to. But the cool thing is that, in addition to having the user database, um, it also has a SAML 2.0 provider. And since that's what I need uh, in order to demonstrate that, uh, the functionality. That's what I installed. It was uh, pretty simple to get up and running. Um, but I will say that if you don't already know SAML, um, it is a bear to figure out. So um, there are certainly easier identity providers out there. But um, this one is a full identity and access management system. So that kind of uh, complicated things. Anyway, um, I'm running Keycloak. I've got a SAML profile created for DSIM. Um, because, like, like I said, I'm real creative with my names and everything. Um, so nearly every identity provider uh, will give you information that you need to set up your connection in an XML format. It is something that you would get from your SAML administrator. Um, you cannot set up SAML on your, or you can't set up both ends of the connection on your own unless you happen to wear both hats. Um, pretty much if you're the sysadmin for DSIM, you're going to have to figure out who your SAML administrator is for your organization. And they'll give you, you know, they'll ask you some questions and we'll go over what those typical questions would be. And then when they're done, they'll usually say, well, here's your metadata URL. So that metadata URL is going to really simplify the setup on our end because OpenDSIM says, oh, I know what this stuff is. I'll actually go in and gather the pieces that I need out of it. And as long as you gave me a good URL, then, you know, we're in good shape. So let's get into the app. So that backdoor account was called DSIM Admin, or I'm sorry, it's called DSIM. And the password is DSIM Admin. So here we are, we're logged in as an administrator. And the first thing that you can take a look at is to see that it created an account called Emergency Administrator. And the user ID is DSIM. 
Now, an important thing to realize is that once you flip on either LDAP or SAML authentication, or well, once you're actually authenticating against your, your real back end, um, if you don't have an account in here that's an administrator um, with a user ID that you can authenticate as, uh, you may be locked out of OpenDSIM. So the first thing that you should do is go add your own account with your user ID if it doesn't happen to be DSIM. So for my install here, I've got one called DSIM Admin. And blah, blah, okay. So I filled out the basic information that's required. And I'm going to give it Manage Site and Users, which allows me access to the configuration screen. But I'm also going to get Enter Modify Contacts and Departments. That's what gives me access to this screen, so I can go and give other accounts their rights. Okay, so those are the two important things to get with your first setup, so that you can get away from using this backdoor account or the bootstrap account. So we create that, and we now have blah blah as a user that can log in once I've got an identity provider configured. So we're going to do SAML, right? So let's click on the SAML tab here. A little bit of information we need to put in. I need to tell it what's my URL. So SAML, um, in order to set it up, typically is going to lock it in to say, yeah, I'll take requests from this DSIM app, but I'm only going to allow it to go to come from or to go back to a specific URL. So you need to tell me what your URL is. So you kind of lock that in ahead of time. There is a, I'm going to leave this enabled for now. Um, once you get everything working, you will typically disable this. Um, the success page is um, kind of an intermediary. After you've logged in with your identity provider, it sends information about you back to OpenDSIM. And so the success page will show for 10 seconds before it actually goes to the main OpenDSIM screen. And it basically shows you exactly what data the identity provider sent back about you. So when you are trying to figure out what the attributes are called or what the names are, um, that's a good that's a good debugging tool for you. So we're going to leave that enabled so I can show you what it's like. All right. So remember I talked about certificates. We need a generator certificate. So this is the service provider side, the SP information. So DSIM is the entity ID that I created in my uh, identity provider. And then this is all defaults for me because if I'm writing the app, I'm going to put in the defaults that are mine. Now, if your organization wants to manage the keys and certificates that are used for all applications, by golly, you can you can do that, and you can copy and paste the X509 certificate information into this spot here. If you don't care, because SAML doesn't really care, as long as it it can be a self-signed certificate, as long as the identity provider and and service provider have already exchanged those, it, it's okay. So in this case, we're just going to generate a brand new certificate. So click this button and boom, there's your certificate. There's your key and there's your certificate. So if your um, organization says, well, you can generate your own. We just need a copy of it in escrow. Then you can copy it out of here and paste it and send it to them. Whatever you need to do. Now, the identity provider is going to have an entity ID and a, a URL for doing single sign-on and one for a single logout service. And it's going to have a certificate that we need to know about in advance so that we can know whether or not a, it's called an assertion. When somebody logs in, it sends an assertion back to OpenDSIM and it's going to be signed using a certificate. So we need the public side of that certificate so that we can validate that it's a valid signature. So that's a lot of data to grab. And if you're unlucky enough to where you don't have a metadata.xml that you can pull from, you'll have to extract this from your SAML administrator. They'll have to send you all this information. But if you do happen to have a URL that you can get to that has the metadata in it, then all you have to do is populate that field right there and click this button and it pulls all the stuff out of the XML for you. So definitely much more simplified than what we used to have 
in prior versions of OpenDSIM. So let's go ahead and update that. <clears throat> now, if you'll recall, I've still got LDAP set in, in my config map in Kubernetes. So it's not actually using SAML yet. We've just put in the information about how to use it. There's another part to it. We have to map our attributes. So, and of course, I didn't quite go with the same defaults here when I was setting up mine. <clears throat> so, your SAML administrator, when you say, hey, I need to hook up my OpenDSIM app into our corporate identity provider, they're going to say, what attributes do you need? And you can actually say, well, let me tell you, here's what I need, or here's what I'd like. What you need is given name, surname, and mail. So those three things. You're automatically going to be given the user ID as the SAML subject. So you don't have to ask for anything extra on that one. So the extra attributes you want are going to be given name, surname, and mail. Now, if they happen to have telephone number, mobile, and pager, or whatever three things that you want for your three phone numbers, great, have them included. If they don't pass that information, it's no big deal. They'll just get left blank. Now, if you want to be able to manually put that in using the user ad administration, and you don't want it to keep getting overwritten, then you need to blank out these fields. Because otherwise, it's going to try to replace those every time somebody logs in. So what we've described here is using SAML or actually LDAP, this, this applies to LDAP as well, as an authentication server only. So the only purpose that we are going to the identity provider is to verify that the person is who they claims that they are or who they claim that they are. So if I claim to be DCM admin, then at least my password or whatever authentication requirements the identity provider had set forth, they met the requirements. So yes, by golly, they are DCM admin. You can also utilize both LDAP and SAML for your authorization, which is not just who they are, but what they are allowed to do. And that's done through group memberships. So these are all defaults for LDAP. Now, if you leave this field blank, the SAML attribute containing groups, if you leave that blank, then it will only use SAML for the authentication and the rights are managed through the user administration screen like we saw before. If you actually fill this in, then it will grab whatever membership gets passed back and it will overwrite what is in the database every time somebody logs in. So let's start off with just using it for authentication and then we'll come back and we'll fill this part in. So, all right, I'm updating with all the last of that information. Now, in order to make it take effect, I need to modify my config map and change from LDAP to SAML, right? Because that's the authentication method that we're going to use now. And the other thing is, when you change a config map, it doesn't change the running container. You have to kick off a new container to make it pick up the change in the config map. So we're going to delete the old container, which is going to cause Kubernetes to start up a new one. And once it goes green, then we can go take a look at our application. How's the weather out there? Are you doing good? All right. Yeah, it's hot here. Hot and humid. Okay, we're good. Let's go back to our application. So if we click on home, it's going to say, hmm, I don't know who you are. You need to authenticate, which uh, I went too soon. i got to wait for it to actually. Okay, so now it redirects me to Keycloak so I can do my login for OpenDSIM. So DCM admin is the user that I want to log in as right now. So we're going to do DCM admin, DCM admin. This is that success screen that I was telling you about. So it's returning given name, email, surname, and then an array called role, which contains all the roles that I happen to have. 
Now that was pretty quick, but you can always go back in the video and pause. So if you go into user administration though, when you take a look at my user account, it doesn't have any of those extra roles. And the reason why is because we did not enable the authorization portion. We only enabled the authentication portion. But it also replaced my blah, blah with my actual first name and last name from the identity provider. So that makes sure that it, your identity provider is your central point of truth about who someone is. So it's always going to override any data that you have in these fields. So now if we want to actually enable the auth or the authorization portion of it, I'm passing an array called role. And I have site access is one of the roles. And I have global read. And I have global write. You can tell I've already filled this in before. And global delete. And then I'm not passing it. Um, that happens to be a role I didn't assign it to my administrator because it's redundant to have this if you've already got global read and write and delete so it's not being assigned now um, I typically don't enable this either um, I think this is what I called them I didn't assign them to me Mainly because, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, rack requests is something that I wrote about 15 years ago as a workflow um, for getting things into the data center. And it just didn't really work very well. So I kind of abandoned it. But then other users said that they were using it, so I didn't remove it from the application. But it's not anything that I've really touched in about 12 to 15 years. So, um, Contact admin, and then bulk operations, finally site admin. Okay, so we're going to update that. So the next time that I was to log in, it would actually check for these particular memberships that get passed back in the array called role. So if I don't happen to have one of these, then it removes it from my account. So that's, that's a pretty cool way to do that. All right, so one last thing that we need to do. How did we get into this initially? We used what we're calling a backdoor account or an LDAP emergency password. Once you go to production, once you've got this working the way that you want it to, you don't want that backdoor to still be open, do you? So we're going to come over here to LDAP. And we've left it pretty obvious. Emergency bypass password. It's currently set to DCIM admin. If you make this blank, then it will disable the emergency bypass password. Once I do that, there is no more. Now the DSIM user still exists. The emergency user administrator still exists. But the only way to get to it would be if your identity provider actually provided a login to someone named DSIM. So if you wanted to truly disable it, you could come over here and you could disable the account and update it. Okay. So now I've got to fix an issue with my logout because it's not sending it back to the right location. But you'll notice that we're now logged out. Okay. Let's log in again as DCIM admin. Actually... Let's log in as DSIM user. Okay. Oh, I'm an end user. You'll notice I've got site access. I can interact requests. I can admin my own devices. But I, I don't have global read or global write. Well, that's probably what you should have. So you'll notice that the menu is different. So it goes ahead and it changes things based on, like I said, i got to fix that part. So now if we go back to our admin account, we can compare the two users and we can see exactly, oh, I, I need to turn off the success screen as well. So like I said, this is really handy when you're trying to get your configuration right. But once you've got it, 
you just go in and disable it and it'll stop showing that page and it'll immediately take you to the home screen immediately take you here all right so we go into user administration and you'll see it added that ad, it added that end user account that I logged in as just a minute ago so it had admin owned devices and interact requests that's all it's allowed to do if I go into my admin user DSIM it'll have more than the, originally it only had managed site and users and manage contacts and departments those were the only two rights that it had before so we go to it now and you'll see this matches all the group memberships that were passed by the identity provider all right I think we're done so I hope this has been helpful to you remember to join the mailing list for the late latest release information and if you enjoy the software and would like to make a donation um, I do enjoy drinking a beer or two um, so you can PayPal me uh, a beer. Uh, please visit opendsim.org for information on how to do so. All right. Have a great weekend.